Hey folks, Benny with T7 Woodworks here. Welcome to my shop. Last year I made this sweet little butcher block and it didn't take too long to sell in my shop. I had a guy reach out really liking the design, so he asked that I recreate it. Only this one to his specific dimensions as well as the addition of a juice groove. Stick around to see how I did version 2 and witness some of the issues I ran into along the way. And we're starting things off with these four quarter boards of walnut. Four quarter is just a fancy way of saying one inch. Six quarter would be an inch and a half. Eight quarter would be two inches, so on and so forth. Quarter is simply referencing a quarter of an inch. So when you have four quarters of an inch, or four quarter, you have a one inch thick board. At the time of milling, that is, which is what I have here. Now that I've selected and marked the best parts of the board, I took it over to the miter station and cut it to length. From here, I need to get the long edges perfectly flat using the jointer. With the edges jointed, I now have a perfectly flat edge to reference against my table saw's fence. This is critical as my table saw can now make a perfectly parallel cut to the jointed edge. Unfortunately in woodworking, nothing is perfect. It's important to identify potential issues early so they don't arise later on in the build like this big old ugly chip. The solve here is to cut the dang thing off. With the rough measurement transferred to my table saw fence, I scooch the fence in just a little closer to my blade, then simply run the board through one more time. And just like that, there's no more chip. Just like the original butcher block, the first panel has to be made up of three separate boards. So I need to rip one of the boards straight down the center. I selected this one as the grain structure best mimics the structure of the original board. And going back to finding issues early, this little crack is a great example of that. So off with his head. I like to mark my boards so that when I shuffle them around, I know exactly how they go back together. It's less important to do with just three board panels, but I still include it in my workflow. It's a good practice, I suppose. Using butcher paper under all your glue-ups is also a good practice, unless you like to clean up big old messes. Now watch closely as I perform this highly complex glue-up. Well... I guess I didn't record it. You'll just have to take my word for it though. But here's the result. After many failed glue ups in the past, I find that pairing four way pressure clamps with parallel clamps tends to yield excellent results. If you're interested, I have Amazon affiliate links for these clamps in the video description below. Be sure to check them out. Bring the funk back. I find it's best to take 5 to 10 minutes to rough sand all the dry glue nubs off the board. This allows you the ability to rest it flat on surfaces, which in my case is very important for the next step in this process. Which is running it through the planer. Uh, or not. This planer is not exactly an option. At any rate, if you dig what you're seeing so far, now's probably a great time to support my channel by liking, subscribing, and hitting that little bell icon. The more likes and subscribers and bell clicks that I get, the closer I get to a proper size planer. Also, if you have any comments or questions, please bombard me with them. I love hearing what you guys have to say, and I could talk shop all day. I've learned a lot from you on previous videos, so let's keep it going. So as you can clearly see, I need to take another approach to flatten this board. First, I need to secure it to the table. We'll do that by applying painter's tape to the tabletop and to the bottom side of the board. 
Then adhere it to the table using CA glue with the tape as my contact points. This creates a very sturdy, non-permanent bond to the tabletop. I used this very same method of flattening to surface a custom RV table I did for a guy. If you're interested, check out the video above. I think it's pretty cool. The method also works fine for this project too. Let's go! Well, once the first side is flat, from here, I'll flip it over and repeat the exact same process on the other side. Using my surfacing bit as a guide, I locate the highest part of the board and drop it down just below that. Then I'll begin removing material from there. Before I could consider cutting any individual slats for the second glue up, I first need to clean up any imperfections left over by the router sled. I'll do that by hitting both surfaces with 80 grit sandpaper just to clean it up. And once I'm satisfied with the surface, I'll go ahead and set up my table saw sled. With longer boards like this one, they tend to want to tilt off the sled. To prevent this, I like to clamp a piece of wood above the workpiece so that it's touching the top surface but not applying so much pressure that I can't move it from side to side. This is a safety thing more than anything. It mimics the downward pressure needed to prevent the board from tipping, but I don't need to use my hand to do it. First cut is always just to clean up the edge. Then every cut after that will go straight to the stop block, ensuring they're all the same. Okay, I feel like it's starting to look familiar again. Now it's time to arrange the slats so they best match the original board. With a little flip-flop here, a little twisteroo there, and uh, voila! It's the arrangement I'm looking for. I prefer to take a little bit of time to go through each slat and hit it with a couple of passes at 220. This removes any little splinters or burrs that might still be hanging on from the cross-cutting process. And with everything dusted off, it's now time for glue. One big error I'm making here, and I didn't realize it at the time, is that I'm doing this glue up without calls on either side of the clamps. As a general rule of thumb, when you're clamping any end grain strips together, be sure to use calls as they apply even pressure throughout the clamps and prevent isolated pressure points which can cause the slats to crack, bow, bend, or slip. All the bad things. What? Thankfully, I realized the error of my ways, and I corrected it. And then I threw a big old railroad track on top, just to keep it flat. Hey, at this stage, the board is really starting to come together. Even though I'm about to run it through the drum sander, I still like to hit it with the belt sander first, just to make sure it gets sanded as evenly as possible in the drum sander. Yes, also, I know, my outfeed table needs to be adjusted. But before you go throwing heat my way, just know, I adjusted it. I like to use the miter saw to square one of the edges first. You can do this on the table saw, which I will for the following cuts, but the first cut I always find to be easier and quicker at the miter station. And from here I'll square the rest of it up at the table saw. One feature the first board didn't have was a juice groove. For board 2.0, my client requested I slap one on. That's just what I'm doing here with this wacky jig. The spacers I inserted on the inside walls of the jig dictate how far or close the juice groove is to the edge of the cutting board. The walls of this jig are slightly higher than the thickness of the board itself. The jig walls need to be slightly proud so that the base of the router will have an edge to follow.
Now that I've made it past that step without completely destroying the board, it's time to move it over to the router table and apply the roundovers to the corners and the bottom edge of the board. I like to leave the top surface completely flat. I think this aesthetic gives the board a stout and durable look. Once I mark my handholds, it's back over to the router table to hog them out. I like to remove material in 8th inch increments. Okay, from here on out, everything I'm doing is pretty self-explanatory. So I'll shut my yapper for a minute, and you could just enjoy the rest of the video. I'll be back shortly. Guys, what do you think? Did I replicate that board well? Let me know what all your thoughts are in the comments below. Good, bad, indifferent, or whatever. And I want to hear it all. And if you really like the video, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. We'll see you on the next one.